This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is acting. It's another of my actors on acting shows. Paul Lieber, an American actor, is before you, and we will talk about his life and his career in acting. Paul Lieber is an American actor. He's appeared for many decades on American television and film. Uh, People may know him uh, most from maybe uh, some of his episodic television work, including uh, 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 a recurring role on the old show Barney Miller. But uh, newer audiences have also gotten to, used to him in 21st century television. So welcome, Paul. Uh, I like to give all of my guests, whether we're talking about uh, cosmology or, or history or acting, uh, a few minutes to uh, just open up about themselves, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of your life and career. So, Paul, for those who may not know of you, can you just give a sort of little pricey of who you are and acting and how you got into it? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Paul Lieber, as you so eloquently introduced, introduced me, uh, and uh, I'm a actor. Presently, I uh, teach acting, actually, at uh, AMDA, uh, but uh, I'm originally uh, from the Bronx. I don't know if you know where the Bronx is. Yeah, I'm from New York. Okay. Well, the Bronx is not Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, the Bronx, when I grew up, was uh, you know very provincial in ways, uh, though it had pockets. What was great about the Bronx was it was uh, diverse, and there were fab I mean, just hundreds of kids your age, and they were into all kinds of things. So there were pockets of uh, kids that were uh, into the arts. Uh, so it offered that, but it was not Manhattan. Manhattan was, you know, the uh, you had culture, you had theater, you had museums, you uh, you had more diversity, you had interracial couples, which at that time didn't really exist in the Bronx. Uh, so it was a it was a it was a very very different thing, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I'm uh, I've come to appreciate the Bronx a great deal. In fact, my son goes to school in the Bronx right now. He's at Fordham University, ah. which is uh, not too far from where I grew up. I know I'm an out of boroughs boy myself. I was born uh, in Booth Memorial Hospital in Queens uh, and grew up on the Brooklyn Queens border. So I remember back in the '70s when Mayor Koch was there, he'd, he'd have all the burned out buildings in Bushwick where I used to play, and they put up the placards with like you know a little plant, just like in the South Bronx. It looked like you know Beirut. Right. Yeah. Right. It uh, does, but it's very different now. Oh yeah, it's, very, it's been gentrified. Yeah, it's it's, it's it not not up near Fort, not near Fordham University, but yeah. it's uh, I still love it. Uh, I could walk for hours in the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, well, I want. I, I want to just ask a question that I know you, you're free to not answer if, if you want, because I have some actors don't want to answer it. Uh, uh, I know uh, looking on your Wikipedia page, you didn't give a, a date of birth. So I'm assuming that you're somewhere in your 60s or something. Uh, do, do you want to reveal yet? Because some, especially some of the women don't want to, don't want to, you know, uh, get yeah, themselves. I have a huge feminine side. So, uh. so uh, which might include, might include that. Okay. Uh, I think from from the course of us our, our talking, Dan, okay. that uh, you'll you'll probably figure out okay. you'll probably figure out my age range. Okay. Well, let, let me let me go back because before we were talking, I just mentioned how uh, I, I sometimes like to ask about influences. Uh, growing up. Uh, were you influenced and wanted to become an actor early? Did you watch John Wayne movies or Glenn Ford or, or you know, old Gary Cooper movies? Uh, what what was your impetus? Was there any heroes on television, Bonanza or whatnot, that you wanted, you know, to be a Cartwright or something? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I wanted to emulate them or I had any idea in my mind that I, that this, I want to act. Uh -huh. But I did watch those shows. I, 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 who was Wild Bill Hickok? Uh, who, oh. who played that part? I'm trying to think. Uh, God, I mean, that's a little before my time. I, I, I do, do remember watching repeats of uh, Chuck Connors as the Rifleman, but uh, right. I, I wasn't a big Western fan. Yeah, I liked I liked the Rifleman. Uh, uh, Hopalong Cassie was before your time. It was pretty much before my time. Yeah. Uh, but Wild Bill Hickok was someone I really, I really liked. Yeah. I don't know why, yeah. but I, but I just uh, really uh, liked him. As far as them uh, saying, hey, uh, why don't you act? Why don't you uh, put on a cowboy hat and, 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 and join the cast? No, I didn't really uh, 
uh, I, I can't say I was influenced by that. No. I think that uh, we would go to Broadway shows occasionally. Uh -huh. My family, yeah, I remember seeing that as a kid. I actually remember seeing Inherit the Wind uh -huh. with uh, Paul Muni, mm. of all people, who was in it. Yeah. I believe he was in it. I may be imagining that, but I, I think he was in it. I also saw uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf yeah. and, uh, uh, and uh, Guys and Dolls mm. and other Broadway shows. Yeah. Uh, I remember being... Uh, fascinated with it and 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 uh, and just uh really kind of hypnotized by the idea that these were live people mm. uh, in front of me uh not that we were sitting in the front row mind yeah. you but but uh so I, I i i guess that had an impact on me but it certainly didn't uh, formulate any thoughts in my mind that this is what i want to do uh, you mentioned uh, going to Broadway. I remember as a child uh, going to Radio City Music Hall. And one of my first memories, I was born in 65, was I think I was about four years old. And I think it was the fifth anniversary of the release of The Sound of Music. And I remember seeing Judy, uh, not Judy, Julie Andrews' face, you know, on The Sound of Music, you know, 40 feet high uh, there. And, and just being like, wow, she's so pretty and whatnot. It, it's one of those, those memories uh, there. And people tend to forget that movies used to play for years on end and would have those five-year releases back in the 60s and 70s. You know, it's not, it wasn't like three months and out as it is now. Do you have any memories of uh, going to movie theaters or, or with your friends? Just say that, just as you say that, I, I'm thinking of, I saw that with my mother, we saw The Defiant Ones. Ah. With, uh, Sidney Poitier, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, and yeah. Tony Curtis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, Were they chained together? Chained together, yeah. yes. And they imagined at first uh, having this incredible animosity toward each other, mm. uh, becoming, uh, you know, really uh, close. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I would say they, they, they became, uh, they loved one another eventually by the end of the movie. I don't remember the movie at all, but I remember thematically that's what, what, the, what, the, what it was about. Yeah. Um, how about your family? Uh, did you come from a, a family of artists? Uh, w were you into any other arts? Because I, on your website, paullieber.com, which I'll link to below here, uh, you you have a, a book of poetry, and I, I want to ask you about writing later on. But uh, uh, was your your father a sculptor? Your mother an actress, or, or what? Uh, no, no, no. My mother, my mother did. Uh, she painted. She. Uh, she was, uh, uh, and she was, uh, had a flair for, for, for painting. She played the piano. Uh, she had an incredible ear. You could hum something and she could play it on the piano. Mm. Uh, a kind of um, red time style. Uh, uh, so I would say yes. And my father uh, was not in the arts, but uh, uh, I, I remember if we watch if Shakespeare was on TV or something like that, he was uh, totally engrossed in it and uh, had a had a fondness for it. But no, uh, they didn't uh, professionally. They didn't come close to being uh, artists. How about uh, when you were growing up as a teen? I know when I was a kid, routinely in high school or junior high, you know, guys and dolls would be made and. Uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet. What did you ever go out for the uh, the drama society or, or acting in in those years? No, no. Uh, so, so how then did you get into acting? Was it in, uh, later? Good question. I'm still trying to get into it. You know, <laughs> uh, the uh, how uh, I I I think in my senior year in college, I um, I I got a BA in psychology. But my last year, I was online. Uh, when you register, you register for course, courses. This was at CCNY, uh -huh. City College, New York. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy, a guy in front of me who was an actor, and I and I said, Bruce, what do you think? Do you think I could uh, act? Do you think I should take acting? And he said, Sure, why not? And uh, so so I took an acting class my senior year. And uh, uh, it, it enjoyed it immensely. By the way, just tangentially, uh, Bruce ended up marrying my 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 college girlfriend. <laughs> but they have since divorced, and uh, I, you know I don't know uh, where either of them uh, ended up or where they're at now. 
So since you took that uh, uh, psychology course, um, has that affected the way that you approach characters? For example, uh, do you approach characters from the inside out or from the outside in? Uh, do you have to, like, if you're if you're playing a pimp or a, a drug addict, do you have to sort of try to uh, research it or some actors say, you know, just act, just pretend? Yeah, well, I have played a pimp. Yeah. I haven't played I don't think I've played a drug addict. Uh, but, uh, I don't think taking psychology in undergraduate school and getting a BA in psychology has, uh, impacted, uh, much of my life at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it was interesting at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wouldn't say getting an academic degree, uh, 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 did, did much to, uh, affect uh, any kind of uh, creative endeavor. So what was your first role, either on, I would assume on stage, uh, and, and where was it? Was it off-Broadway or was it, uh, you know, Summerstock? Or? Jesus, I, uh, my first role? Yeah. Uh, I, I studied at a place, I, when I got out of college, uh, I uh, studied at a place called HB Studio, which was a great place to study, Herbert Berghoff and Uta Hagen. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, started the school. What was wonderful about it is that it was uh, wonderful teachers, inexpensive. And I took a class with Bill Hickey. I don't know if you know who yes, Bill Hickey yes. was. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he was a terrific actor. And uh, I ended up uh, doing a play that uh, one of the teachers uh, uh, would direct it. I think that was the first play I did. It was Antigone, ah. uh, and I played the guard. Uh, I think that was the first. But I got into doing uh, Broadway very quickly. I, I started studying with a woman named Mira Rostova, who was, uh, I was totally uh, smitten with, who was a... Uh, well, I still consider a, a genius of sorts. And, uh, and after studying with her for, uh, I don't even know if it was a year, I, I auditioned for a uh, Broadway show called And Miss Reed and Drinks a Little with Julie Harris and Estelle Parsons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I didn't know who Julie Harris was, uh, but I knew who Estelle Parsons was because she was in Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. So anyway, it was a it was a part with Estelle, and uh, it was a play by Paul Zindel, uh, and uh, and and I got in. I actually got the part, and so really I got into acting pretty quickly, uh, professionally, uh, and so uh, it just it happened rather fast after college. So. Uh I know I've interviewed a number of actors, and some actors uh, have the the feeling that the real acting, real acting, is is on the stage, uh, and that theater and and uh, television, or rather, uh, film and television, are sort of derivative of that. Are you one of those actors that feels that that there's nothing like a live audience, and that's the essence of acting, or do each of the things that you can do, even voice acting, has its own challenge that you enjoy? Uh, no, I, 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 essentially, I think, essentially, that there's no difference. Yeah. Essentially, if you're going to play uh, Biff in uh, Death of a Salesman, uh, or what, whatever part, Hamlet, whether it's on film, that the what really measures you as an actor is how much you identify with the part. Mm -hmm. How much you identify with the situation, and and uh, so regardless of whether there's a camera or whether you're on stage, those are technical differences. Of course, you've got to use your voice if you're on stage, and and uh, other aspects uh, in terms of movement and things like that are different. But I but I think the really the essence of what you're doing is uh, understanding what the character is about, what the situation is about. And uh, accepting that and being able to uh, put yourself in that situation. Yeah, uh, 
with theater acting, you certainly have to speak more loudly. You can't have those intimate close-up scenes. Um, but I also have mentioned a few times with some actors that they've talked about the difference between sort of regular stage theater and then theater in the round. Uh, is there any difference for you? Because with theater in the round, you know, if you're in the background uh, and, and doing something in, in a regular uh, theatrical setup uh, where you have downstage and upstage, uh, you don't have to necessarily, I guess, be as on the mark. But when you're in theater in the round and every, you're 360, uh, I don't think you have that luxury. Um, is there any, have you done both types then? Yeah, I have. And, and, and uh, it, it complicates the picture. But uh, like I said, es essentially the, the measure of, um, uh, of a performance uh, is uh, how much you identify with the character, how much you're, you're in the circumstances. And of course, you've got to move and you've got to adjust yourself to uh, the audience so they so that you, they see you and that you can share the experience with them but uh, uh to me it's secondary mm. yeah uh another actor that i interviewed a few years ago was telling me an anecdote about jason robards the great american actor uh in theater especially and how uh when he when this actor visited or, or went backstage after robards performance robards quickly sort of went to him and said, did you notice how I flubbed that line so in, in, in whatever scene it was? And the, the actor sheepishly admitted that, yes, he had. And, and the robot said, but he said the important thing was he went on as if he didn't flub it because most of the people would not know that he had flubbed that line. And so you have to keep on going as if it wasn't a flub. And as you're doing 100 or 200 or 300 renditions over the, over the course of weeks or months, uh, you know, you have to go with that flow. Um, is there that kind of uh, tingly excitement when you do flub that there's also an opportunity uh, there? I guess it, it can be. Uh, uh, funny, when, when you say that, I remember, because I did a play called Lenny, uh -huh. uh, which was on Broadway. Was that a based on Lenny Bruce? It was based on Lenny Bruce, yeah. and it, it won, won the Tony for Best uh, Play that year, and I wasn't playing Lenny, yeah. but uh, Cliff Gorman was playing Lenny, for which he won a Tony. But uh, I remember going up a, 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 on a particular line, I just totally, totally could, could not, I didn't know, I didn't know what it was, where, I, I think I knew where I was. I, I definitely knew I was in, in a Broadway show uh, at the Brooks Atkinson Theater, but uh, I, did not have any idea what the line was. And uh, uh, I came out of it, but I can't say that it was an inspiring experience. Yeah. Uh, I, quite the contrary. Mm -hmm. It was a terrifying experience. And I think I kept that line written on something nearby in case, in case I came across it again. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. and I can understand what... Uh, but I do agree with the fact that regardless, you flub it, you flub it, you move on. You move on and you continue as, as in life, as, in, as in, in everything. I mean, you make a mistake in basketball and you, you, uh, you blow a layup or, or whatever, or you make an errant pass, you, you, gotta, you, you gotta forget about it and you play the rest of the game. So uh, when you're acting in whatever medium, uh, is your acting a sense of your uh, wanting to get away from Paul Lieber or to bec become what Paul Lieber was meant to do? In other words, is it sort of your sense sort of feeling that this is what you were born to do or is acting a way to get away from uh, your person, be someone else other than yourself? Because I've had actors say both ends. Yeah, no. No, I'd love to get away from Paul Lieber. I know I don't see, I don't see like there's any, there's any escape yeah. <laughs> that I know of. Though I have friends that believe in reincarnation, uh -huh. and uh, but I'm not, I don't subscribe to that. No, I think my approach to acting is to identify with the character as much as I can, mm -hmm. and in the process of identifying with the character you draw upon personal experience mm -hmm. uh, just because, you know, we, you know, we have lives and we have experience and 
if you're doing a character where somebody dies and, and, and you've experienced that, someone close to you dies, then you're going to uh, either naturally or intentionally draw upon that experience in order to identify with the character. So uh, I don't think uh, I don't think it's for me anyway. It's possible to run away from myself uh, in playing some, in playing uh, any character. In fact, I use you know myself as a resource in order to understand the character. Uh, unlike a lot of the the more, uh, I guess uh, we call it just particularly creative arts like writing or music or or uh, visual arts, acting is collaborative and it's performing. Uh, and so, uh, to a certain degree, your own uh, ability to have a good night on on the stage or have a good take during uh, filming of a scene or for TV or, or films is dependent on upon someone else. Um, to what degree is that a good thing that you know that you felt or a negative thing? And I'm sure you probably worked with some people who were just kept flubbing uh, all the time. How do you overcome that kind of thing where you have either someone who's a prima donna or someone who just is not getting it that day, you know, not hitting it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a poem that deals with that. Uh -huh. Should I, can I read the poem? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Really? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let me just find. Uh, this is in the book "Interrupted by the Sea." Okay. Uh, and it's it's by it's by me, and um, uh, <clears throat> Okay, it's called Problem on Stage. Okay. So here's, uh, it was a play that I was doing, and it's called Problem on Stage. And it's going to start off with she, which is the other actress. She says, move forward, not side to side. Stand straight, I'll come to you. And I ask, how about when I kiss your neck? And she answers, just bend as long as you're lower. The next day I receive a note from the stage manager to keep my mouth closed when I kiss her. Although I thought it was, but I might have moved from side to side. The word from another producer is she's really upset and that this producer is being pressured by the other producer for me to keep my mouth closed. But this actress has always been difficult. And when she pulls away from the osculation scene out of loyalty to my wife, although in the scene before my wife says it's okay for us to make love, when she breaks away, I lean on the character and wait for her next line, which is marinating in her stomach area, spiraling up her esophagus as it churns and churns. And by the time sounds form words and they are released or open lips, they've lost all logic, all semblance of meaning. But in fairness, they're personal enough. And I'm thinking Lee Strasberg lives, although he too was misunderstood. And the knowledge that her actual sister is homeless and an addict and no longer rouses my no longer rouses my sympathy when she withdraws from the closed lips of my character, the lips her character is supposed to find irresistible. So in other words, she was she was she was very she was very difficult and the fact that uh she was complaining and it was it was difficult, uh, made, made things difficult with the producer. And uh, your original question was what, Dan? Was basically, uh, you know, how you deal with someone who's not hitting a home run when they're, they're acting with you and how you overcome that. Well, yeah, the way, it was very difficult to overcome this situation because hmm. she was always complaining. And, and eventually, I mean, uh, in other plays, you, you, you run into this and you just deal with it the best way you can. I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I, de I dealt with it effectively, but um, uh, the show must go on. So you uh, try to be as diplomatic as you can and try to be truthful to the way that the way that I saw that my character ought to be played 
without compromising too much to how she to her 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 needs mm -hmm. though you know you try to do as much much as you can mm -hmm. Uh, moving on then to uh, film and television, where you can do retakes if if a line is flubbed or the director wants to have, you know, twenty seven takes and, and pick and choose from the best parts of each. Um, is that? I mean, obviously, uh, if they're moving in for a close up, there's a different way to act than if you're projecting out into an audience of five hundred people in a theater. Um, uh, you said it's pretty much the same for you. Um, but it, it, I would think there has to be uh, certain degrees of subtlety because if, if a camera is panning, uh, coming into your face, uh, th there's a different kind of acting. You know, for example, uh, in European theater, uh, in European film, rather, uh, they do what I call just uh, as a layman, sort of full body acting. For example, Max von Sydow in a lot of Bergman films, there's uh, the famous, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the, the, the Virgin Spring where... His, his his he's a knight and his daughter has just been raped and, and mutilated and he's at this creek this virgin spring and we don't see his grief in his face as you would in most american film we see just this this big knight sort of slumping his body slumping from behind um uh, can you talk to me about the, the differences the subtleties of acting on film or a, a medium where it's it's recorded and can be redone versus uh stage Uh, you know, I, I still think, I still stand by what I said earlier, yeah. which, that essentially there's a, a no difference that you've got to I, I identify with the character and the situation. The luxury of doing a film or a uh, TV show to some extent, maybe a lesser extent, is that you uh, get more cracks at it. Mm -hmm. You might not you might not do it the way you think uh, you uh, uh, want to do it. You think the way that's you know fair to do, uh, the way you interpreted it, and so you get another crack at it, um, and you get a retake. Uh, you don't have that luxury in the theater until the next night. <laughs> so you gotta wait. You gotta you gotta sleep on it, and then and then. Uh, uh, make a note to yourself and then do it the way you uh, think uh, is, is the right way to do it. Um, how about uh, if you have you ever done just voice acting for like commercials or for, for cartoons or, or anything? Uh, yeah, a bit. I wouldn't say extensively, but I, I, I have experienced it. So there when you have when you just have to rely on the voice, is there any difference there than when your actual visage is on screen? No, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I may sound like really orthodox. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's any bit of difference in terms of acting. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, I was thinking of the analogy of like playing basketball. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether you played in the schoolyard or whether you play it uh, in full court. You play professionally, you play in college or high school, or whatever, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, three games of three. You, the idea is still to get the ball in the basket. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I think uh, uh, acting is, it, it, I, yeah, I, I think of it the same way. You know, you still want to identify with the character, be in the circumstances of the play, be truthful, be honest, and... Um, and do it. So, Paul, uh, since uh, you say that acting basically is the same in a different media, let me uh, uh, take a, a couple of different tacks uh, regarding uh, uh, the production of uh, uh, acting. Uh, uh, the director, Alfred Hitchcock, once f famously or infamously said, you know, that you shouldn't treat actors like, uh, you, actors aren't cattle, but they should be treated like cattle. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you probably worked with some directors who are easier to work with, some who are not so easy to, to, to work with. Um, what is the difference in your mind between a director uh, that's a good director or a bad director? Is it merely the technical stuff or is it the director who may not be as you know technically a wizard as, say, an Akira Kurosawa, but someone who works well with the actors and does different takes on stuff? 
and how does that affect, if any way, the performance of yourself? Yeah, I, I think in um, uh, my experience with directors have been varied. Uh, I think you know what comes to mind is I remember a really uh, terrific direction in uh, a Law and Order that I did. Um, and, and the director uh, said I was being, uh, uh, I was a suspect in a crime, as usual, in a law and order. It's not terribly uh, different than uh, any other actor that has acted on law and order. But I was suspected of a particular crime, and they came in, and the director said to me, you know, treat them like, uh, treat them like you've just invited them to a little party. And that, that kind of very uh, seemingly uh, insignificant suggestion was uh, really, really terrific because uh, it, it enabled me to, uh, you know, come on in, have a, have a, have a drink. Do you want anything? Uh, or they were guests. And uh, so I, I think it's a very rare thing, not, not to say anything negative about directors, because my wife is a director. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's very rare. Oh, oh, there have been a number of theater directors that have been extremely helpful. Uh, any that have been a uh, hindrance? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they have. There have been some that, uh, uh, for instance, I remember doing a play early on in New York, and the director gave me a whole series of notes right before I was going on stage. I mean, that's fine to give a, a, a you know notes the night the, the night before or, or whenever, but right when you're going on stage is not really the time because you're in character and you don't want to think of a particular adjustments. You want to think of the character and the uh, uh, just the, the fun of performing. So it's not uh, it wasn't it wasn't really the right time. But I wouldn't say I've had one particular director, another one. If you're trying to think of abusive directors, one that kept calling me a different name, uh -huh. like, hey, Phil, you ready or purposely, yeah. purposely. <laughs> and sure, I'd like to fucking kill him at the time. <laughs> Are we allowed to curse here, by yeah, the way? Sure. It's, it's the internet. It's not the FCC doesn't control it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to just strangle the guy uh, because he kept doing it. Mm -hmm. He kept doing it. I don't know what his story was, but at the time it wasn't the right thing for me. I, I, I was younger and, and, and didn't quite know how to uh, deal with abuse, uh, though I didn't, I didn't think it um, affected my performance at all. How about uh, some other uh, uh, actors? Oftentimes, uh, I, I think it was Peter Falk, someone once told me uh, in one of the interviews, I believe it was Peter Falk, uh, uh, who told, uh, someone told them they were acting with him, I, I think it was on a Columbo episode, and uh, they had filmed the main scenes, and uh, they had to do some reshoots with this actor who was just, you know, had maybe 10, 12 lines. And yet Peter Falk, I believe it was, stayed and fed the lines to him when it could have been just another guy off screen giving him the lines and how much he appreciated that this guy who at the time in the early mid 70s or whatever was one of the TV's biggest stars staying there and helping this guy who at the time was a nobody. Um, uh, have there ever been any actors that have been particularly generous like that that you can relate to? Yeah, yeah, I think there have been many of them that have been uh, uh, it, that way. Uh, Yes, uh, as far as any one, you know, it's funny, I have my um, resume, my curriculum vitae here, <laughs> just in case you brought up something that I didn't remember. Uh -huh. oh, but, but, but uh, uh, I, uh, you know, n none come to mind, but there have been many, many, many actors are, are, are generous that way and uh, uh, remain. Uh, after they can go back to their dressing room and, and will read with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, uh, I remember I did a, 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 a uh, movie of the week with Mickey Rooney, mm. uh, Bill, Bill on his own. And I played uh, 
a uh, um, a rabbi who was um, coaching him. He finds out he's Jewish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw that. Uh, he, Mickey Rooney was terrific. Yeah. Terrific actor, great actor before my generation. Yeah. Uh, uh, my mother was in love with him. My wife uh, loves the Andy Hardy film, so. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> right, so, so, uh, and, 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 and Mickey, uh, uh, who I really liked, he was just terrific. Uh, and, uh, you know, before, some actors before their take, they may uh, sequester themselves and, and be in a uh, concentrating and all this stuff. And Mickey Rooney would be just, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about the genitals of some woman that he was with yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, I don't mean to say, to sound lewd, it was quite endearing to hear. So, uh, and, and, then this, and then they'd say, action! And, and he would be right in character. Yeah. I mean, he'd just be right there. And uh, it was uh, terrific. But I remember once he couldn't, he, 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 I, I had a scene, and fortunately, there was a friend of mine, a terrific actor, Tracy Walter, who was in the, in the uh, film also. And he read with me, and, and he read Mickey's lines, which was fine. Uh, it happens, you know, it's understandable. Some other actor may read it with you, and the lead actor takes off. But like, as I said before, the job of the actor, the job of the actor is to identify with the character, with the situation, and, and, and do it as if it's happening, as if it's happening, as if it's real. And, and, and you've got to encounter all these things. I knew some actor who, who before he'd go into uh, doing a part, in case there was an abusive act, uh, director mm -hmm. that would be yelling at him, he would rehearse with a friend, and he had his friend scream at him and tell him he was a piece of shit, he couldn't act, he was terrible, he was the worst person in the universe, and then they would do the scene. And he would prepare himself that way in case he ran into uh, that, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess is not uncommon. But um, it's not something that I experienced on a regular basis. Uh, some actors that I've interviewed have told me that either because of their own personal beliefs or if they were religious, there's some kind of roles that they wouldn't do, like they wouldn't play a pedophile or they wouldn't play a Nazi or they wouldn't uh, play you know, uh, something else. Uh, are there any roles that you would not do just you know, uh, for whatever reasons? Um, no. So let me talk then about uh, uh, your writing. You uh, read a poem earlier, and we'll talk a little bit more about the writing uh, uh, later on. Um, have you ever thought of, or uh, have you written any screenplays or uh, uh, anything that has gotten uh, produced as maybe an episode uh, or, uh, of a television show? I wrote a screenplay. It has not been produced, but there's been a lot of interest. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been read by um, uh, a number of... Um, well-known figures in the industry, but it's just not been produced. So uh, as someone who then is sort of at, at the genesis point rather than someone who's sort of uh, transfiguring the words of another, uh, is there, how do you approach, is there a different approach to that? I mean, uh, between performing art and, you know, what we'd call, I guess, uh, creative art in the sense that you're, you're the actual progenitor of that work. You know, I was thinking about this just because uh, you asked me to, to do this interview. So I actually uh, thought about, uh, not in terms of screenplays, but I thought in terms of poetry, you know, what's what's the difference? I thought you'd ask this question, yeah. Dan, and uh, <laughs> there's still time to ask me. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, what's, the, what's the difference between yeah. uh, writing poetry and acting? And, and I was thinking, uh, in acting, you, you, uh, you, you, you try to accept the circumstances of another character and you try to uh, accept the, the, uh, situation of another character and you identify with it. In writing poetry, 
you you identify with yourself and you try to uh, discover what you're feeling, what's going on, what you're, uh, 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 what's happening. In terms of, you know, I'm, I'm realizing as I say this, that this is different than the question that you asked in terms of a screenplay. Uh, but it, but it isn't, you know, you, you, you try to imagine what, it, what it would be like. It's imagining what, what, uh, what a character, as you understand it, is feeling and going through and, uh, with, with an allegiance to a certain a narrative, if it's a screenplay, uh, you don't have, you don't have to do that at home as much. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all a question of humanity. It's all a question of feeling. It's all a question of perception. It's all a question of sharing what uh, you think is going on or what is going on. And uh, as an actor, you want to identify with someone else's reality. A a as a writer, you want to identify with, um, uh, you know, what you, what you perceive the characters you're writing about, their reality, or if you're writing a poem about your own reality. Mm -hmm. um, does that make any sense? Yes, it does. Um... Uh, and uh, I wanted to just uh, follow up, though, uh, uh, about uh, the acting part in that um, at, since you have a long body of work behind you, um, is there are there any one or two roles that uh, uh, you could tell me that uh, you, f you feel that you really nailed the part and those that you didn't nail? And what was the substantive difference? Uh, what, was it something that you just had a bad day or... It, it was the particular writing, and I would assume that that a, a really well written script allows you to jump high. It's being like off a higher uh, uh, diving board, you can do more as you're flipping through the air. You know, be a little bit more creative. Um, uh, are there any particular roles and uh, that that you really nailed it or didn't? And what was the reason for the difference? Let me let me just say how I I define acting. Yeah. Uh, is is the acceptance of, of, of a situation that's that's written um, as opposed to creating the situation that's written so in other words what uh, when you read a play whether it's by Tennessee Williams or Ibsen or, or Chekhov it's accepting what written mm -hmm. you don't have to create it you just have to accept it um, for me and that may that may be difficult in certain in certain instances. For me, I, I I would say that I play oddly enough because it's happening right now. There's a film that's been released, but I did a I did a play called the Chicago Conspiracy Trial, uh -huh. and I played Abby Hoffman. Hmm. Uh, and um, that part uh, was um, easy for me to accept. One because I, uh, I I grew up listening to him. Uh, uh, two because the way the rehearsals were constructed is that there were a lot of uh, literature that we were encouraged to read, and so the whole situation was very uh, palpable to me, very uh, uh, real. So playing that character. Uh, had uh, I was able to accept those circumstances in a very uh, uh, tangible way, and uh, and so it uh, it was it, it was easy uh, in that sense. I think that making circumstances real are are uh, uh, integral for really good acting. That's why you hear actors do all this research stuff. They do a part and they spend all this time doing research is that they want to uh, become part of the tapestry of the time and they want to uh, reflect it in their performance and and what they do so when they i remember um uh jesus i'm having a moment of forgetting uh, a particular actor talking about um searching for private ryan who played the lead in that oh uh hanks tom hanks Tom Hanks talking about that. Yeah, Tom Hanks talking about like uh, going to boot camp and and and, uh, and and really training to be a soldier, and and in so doing, uh, when a line would come up, he had like you know five or six alternatives that were really really uh, 
uh, within his reach, and he was totally in the situation. And why? Because he totally accepted the circumstances of, uh, of, of where he was and what was going on. As far as something where I didn't achieve that, uh, I don't think we have enough time to go into all the parts <laughs> that achieve that. So, Paul, uh, you've spoken and uh, reiterated a few times about uh, acting in different media basically being essentially the same. So I want to just ask you a little bit uh, of a difference, though, between comedy and drama. There are two schools of thought that uh, most of the actors I've spoken to, both in this series and uh, uh, that I've known personally, uh, that some say that uh, uh, comedy is the more difficult one. It's harder to get a laugh than to get a tear. Uh, and there's always the idea of uh, comedians like a, a Jerry Lewis or a Charlie Chaplin wanting to be dramatic actors. On the other hand, there's Woody Allen's famous uh, comment uh, that uh, uh, drama is sitting at the grown-ups table. Uh, is, where do you fall on that side of the spectrum? Do you, do you prefer comedy or prefer drama, and why, if so? I guess I prefer a mix. Yeah. You know, I, I prefer something that's, uh, uh, you know, I, we, we talked about briefly about the Chicago Conspiracy Trial, and Abby Hoffman, I think, was someone who had an appreciation of comedy, but also an appreciation of, of, of um, a, uh, 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 a, a point of view uh, politically and, and a seriousness about him that uh, could be misconstrued. But it was it weaved into who he was and certain things he said and how he said it. And so uh, just using that, I think I prefer a mix. I don't prefer, you know, like a, oh, even Neil Simon, you could say, was a mix. Uh -huh. It was drama mixed with comedy. So I like it. I like it both. But again, again, uh -huh. I will I will uh -huh. go back to my orthodoxy <laughs> and say the crucial thing yeah. is identifying with the character and the situation. Yeah. Now, uh, and, and that when you do that, if the writers, I remember Bill Macy, who was a very good, really close friend of mine, yeah, not the Bill Macy, oh. not, not, this is from Maud, Bill Macy from Maud, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. who was a really good friend. And he would say when something wasn't funny on Maud, he would tell the writers, well, write funny yeah. and it will be funny. So the idea being that if a text is funny and it's done truthfully, it's going to be funny. Yeah. And it's just, if it's understood by the actors, it will be funny. Yeah. If it's not understood by the actors, and you know, it ain't going to be funny. Yeah. Um, by the way, when you mentioned Abby Hoffman, was he alive when you were doing that play? And if so, did you meet him? And how is it? playing someone who's an actual real-life character, uh, I would assume the same orthodoxy applies, but if did Ho was Hoffman alive and did he see you perform? Yes, he did. He, yeah. came to, he came to the play. He was underground, so he had had plastic surgery. Uh. Uh, in fact, I would, you know, it's being a typical, act, I don't know want to say typical actor, but, but being a self-consumed, you know, act, actor after the performance, he, he came over to me, and I only realized in retrospect we talked a while, and then he uh, sent me through a friend a ticket stub uh, saying he was there. As far as being alive, um, you know, a lot of people have played Abby Hoffman. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I think it still goes back to what the script is. Uh, and he said funny things, insightful things, political things. Uh, uh, witty things, and it, you have to uh, look at the script and understand uh, that from the script. And if you if you achieve that, then you um, uh, uh, lo and behold, you have uh, presented him. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you a, a philosophical question about. I, oh, go yeah. ahead. I oh. also played Ilya Kazan, oh, oh. who was live, mm -hmm. yeah. but in a play called Names. And, it, you know, all I did was go, for, I read a lot about it, mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, in this particular play, I, I wasn't in agreement with um, his um, naming names yeah. and, 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 and things that he did, uh, 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 but uh, uh, doing it 
and going from the script and and uh, and which were a lot of his words and a lot of his actions. And then I think I, his uh, son or a daughter saw the play, and it was it, to them I was just like him, mm-hmm. but I wasn't doing him. Yeah. I I was doing what was written yeah. and, and 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 what was uh, what I thought. Uh, the character was expressing. Yeah. Well, like you said, I mean, you can disagree with the, the, the character's motives, whether it's a Nazi or whether it's someone who's quote unquote a fink uh, as he was. And for those who are too young to know, we're talking about Ely Kazan who had named some names at the HUAC uh, hearings back in the 1950s, the House and American Committee's activities. Um, uh, let me just uh, get back to my uh, question though, though more philosophically about art. Um, I've often had uh, arguments and debates with some people, uh, and I, as an artist myself, believe that art is the highest expression of what human culture is, even more so than science. And my rationale basically is, if you took away uh, Leonardo, and you took away Newton, and you took away Einstein, and you know the top twenty scientists, there'd still be other scientists there to discover it. However, if you took away Michelangelo, if you took away uh, Shakespeare, if you took away Stanley Kubrick, you could go for an infinity of other universes and there's not going to be, you know, uh, the the works of Shakespeare. What? It won't be their unique stamp. Right. Right. And so do you, do you, do you believe that, I mean, in whatever minor way to be humble, that, that as an artist, you, you are doing the, the best thing that you were, if you, if you believe in predestined, that you were put here to do X amount of roles and that that is the highest thing that you can do. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, Dan. It's a great question. I don't, I don't think I have an answer to match the question. No. So, so, uh, but let's go on to the next. Okay. Um, uh, let me think. Uh, so, uh, if, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, when you are when you are uh, acting, uh, uh, what kind of memory does it take to to uh, be an actor? Because I know, for example, even if I was great expressively, I just don't have the mind. My mind is too quick and darting. I could never learn the lines. So, are you someone that had to train yourself to have a, a memory that you could, you know, remember? Say, if you were doing like an episode of Barney Miller, I don't know, maybe you had. 12, 15, 20 pages of uh, dialogue. I don't know what it was, but, uh, or is that something that just came naturally to you? What? No, no, it's nothing that came naturally, but I, I, I always, you know, as a friend of mine once said, a guy named uh, Alan Arbus, yeah. who was uh, on MASH, he was the psychiatrist yeah. on MASH, yeah. among other things. Yeah. He was a wonderful photographer and, 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 and a pretty cool human being. Um, he said, you know, I don't memorize lines, Paul. I memorize thoughts. Hmm. And um, and I, I I think in the same way, for instance, Dan, yeah. if you were to uh, see this interview or or this day, all the lines that you said during this day, and you woke up in the morning, you would say, "How the fuck am I going to remember all these lines <laughs> that I say today? That I'm going to say today?" And the thing is, you don't. You it would be daunting if we were presented with the lines that we said during a day yeah. and and why why is it not daunting or why is it easy to do because we're in situations yeah. and the situations uh the situations uh dictate what we say you see somebody on the street and they say hi how you doing and you say fine thanks how are you and then and then what's going on with Alice? And, and they say, well, she's still sick. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So it all is comes out of the situation. And uh, we don't, and the same way when you met, when you approach a part, you really get into the situation of what the actor and what the writer wrote about. And you're thinking about that. And lo and behold, the lines are, are that much easier. Okay. So that that's an interesting point. So you, you're saying, because obviously, uh, if we're talking like a Tennessee Williams play, or we're just talking, an, you know, an episode of a, a sitcom that you're on, uh, there is an artificer. 
it's not it's not the artifice if you're religious, but it is an, someone who is creating those lines. Whereas in real life, things just naturally flow and bubble up, and you can't control them. So you're saying if you're playing a character that has A, B, and C qualities, you, by 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 getting those qualities and imbuing those qualities into yourself, it makes it easier to remember the lines. Yes, and by those qualities, I I I mean the situation that they're in. Mm. And and uh, the relationships, what's what events has hap have happened, all the things that go into the uh, makings uh, of a play. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I mean that reminds me a, a, a lot of uh, Cassavetti's films. John Cassavetti's he often did that too, where he would have uh, specific lines here or there, but he was willing to change them as the actors were working along in a film, and maybe. Uh, the actor was supposed to say A, B, and C, but they end up saying A, F, and J because that's what the situation dictated at that time as they were going through. But it emotionally got the impact that the original lines were, were intending. Right, and he he had a very particular situation in mind. Mm -hmm. He was creating he was creating the parameters for what was uh, what what was happening. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. So, Paul, let's uh, uh, turn now to some of roles specific to you. And I'm going to be looking uh, mostly at the IMDb page since it's a bit longer than your uh, acting resume on uh, your website and also on uh, Wikipedia. So I'm, I'm looking, it says uh, that the first role that you had was uh, from Guru the Mad Monk uh, oh. in 1970. Andy Milligan. Yeah. Yeah, Guru the Mad Monk. You know, I had just started acting. It, it actually is a cult film. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it plays Andy Milligan would make these horror movies. Mm. And um, I, at the time, I was in A Misery and Drinks a Little, which I mentioned earlier by Paul Zindel. Uh, yeah. the, Bill Macy, that's where I met Bill Macy, Julie Harris, and Estelle Parsons. Uh, and it was, uh, I played the lead part. I was the romantic lead and I, and, uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it shot supposedly in the 17th century, uh, 18th century is a low budget movie. So occasionally the camera would pan and you would see a motorcycle parked on the corner. So, and you'd hear a plane overhead, but it was supposed to be the 17th century. Mm. But the movie played all around, has a big following, ha and uh, um, I'm trying to think of the great, terrific actor who was uh, uh, played played the lead, and he was such a help for me because I was. Um, it was the first thing I ever did. Uh, let, me, let me see what let me see what comes up here. Hold on, a guru, the mad monk. Uh, Neil Flanagan with Father Neil Duke. Flanagan. Neil Flanagan, who was a, uh, played the lead roles in so many off off Broadway uh, plays, and he was such he was a sweet guy. He he died of AIDS. It was a time when oh. the AIDS ep epidemic was lethal. Yeah, there was no remedy, and uh, uh, and he was. Uh, uh, very, very helpful, made, really put me at ease. Uh, I wouldn't say at ease because um, uh, there's uh, Michael Caine did a video on eye blinks and he, he said the most important thing is not to blink your eyes when the camera is on you. Well, I think after about 400 blinks in, in that I had in Guru the Mad Monk, I couldn't watch it anymore. But uh, in any event, it's uh, it's an interesting movie. Then it looks like uh, about uh, what seven years later, seven eight years later, you did a, a TV movie. And television movies uh, have gone the way of the dinosaur. It was called Portrait of a Stripper, and it reminds me uh, the last actor I interviewed was a fellow named uh, Lee McCloskey, who was did a, a famed couple of TV movies with uh, Eve Plum back in the mid seventies. It has that very a 1970s telemovie uh, title, Portrait of a Stripper. Uh, what, did you play a pimp in that movie or what? No, I didn't play a pimp in that movie. I paid a photographer that was hired to take pictures of someone's wife uh, who was uh, caught in compromising positions. 
Mm. And uh, apparently I did a really good job, not as an actor, but as taking, <laughs> taking these pictures, these photos. And uh, it was shot in a little complex in Venice, as I remember. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, one of the producers of Lenny was also produced that, that movie. Mm. Uh, I saw the the next one I want to just ask you about. Uh, you did, uh, I guess, a an episode of a TV show called I Shied, and with Joe Don Bacon. I'm thinking, my God, I, I remember that that show from you know, my childhood just for like it was on one season. I think. Does anything stand out about that? Because Joe Don Baker, you know, got fame, I guess, in the late '70s playing Buford Pusser in a a few movies. Uh, does, does anything ring a bell about that role? No, oh, I, I think I was a drug dealer in that. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, all I remember is sitting in a park, I think, dealing, dealing drugs with a, another uh, stage actor from New York. And I think his last name was Stone, huh. um, which is no, um, uh, not that he was Stone, but uh, his name was Stone. And... Uh, that, that's all I remember from that. And uh, I see The Associates. I remember that was a show that I, that I remember that uh, was actually a pretty good uh, sitcom. Uh, and it, you did an episode of that? Yeah, I did an episode of that. That was uh, with Jim Brooks, who yeah. was one of the producers. Uh, and uh, Jim Burroughs directed it. Yeah. Had a, uh, uh, Allie Mills played my girlfriend. And uh, it was a... Uh, uh, you know, very early on, I, w I was pretty young and I didn't know how to deal with, uh, I thought when you uh, were a guest star, that meant you were a star. Mm. And, um, and I insisted when they served me some pedestrian lunch, I, I insisted that I get sushi and, and um, they didn't know how to deal with me. I didn't know how to deal with me. And uh, someone went out and got me sushi. And... Uh, uh, it was, uh, but uh, the show itself was, was pretty good. Allie Mills was great. And, uh, Joe Ragabuta, uh, who uh, was in it, a few, a few other people, uh, uh, that were in it and, uh, it went for a season. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you did Barney Miller, I think for one season you played in, I think maybe seven or eight episodes, you played a character named uh, Dorsey. And I do remember... I, I, I liked the character, and I remember there was like one episode where uh, there was a, a young underage hooker that uh, you, your character befriended. I remember it was quite a touching episode. Um, were they trying to uh, make you a regular to replace? Because that had a sort of a revolving door. Uh, Abe Vigoda left for his own series, and Jack Sue died, and uh, I think uh, the guy who played Chano, Gregory Sierra, also left. Um, were they trying to bring you in as a new character and it didn't work out, or did you just, were you not happy there, or what? Uh, it, it was a situation where uh, uh, I probably, I, I would have done it yeah. had, they, had they asked. They didn't ask after. I think prior, the negotiations were they wanted me to uh, sign a contract where they would uh, dictate whether I would continue the series or not as a character, and I wouldn't agree to that before. And then there was a money negotiation before, mm -hmm. and uh, we, uh, you know, arrived at some terms. But certainly after that, I would have, had they asked, I, I would have continued, uh, but they didn't ask. Fortunately, at that time, I was uh, working uh, pretty much regularly, and I think within a couple of weeks, I did a series called uh, Gangster Chronicles and had a, uh, uh, a recurring role on that, hmm. uh, which I don't think is, is, is on IMDb, but well, it was an interesting uh, series. I, a number, number of people were on it that uh, were quite talented, and uh, it ran for a year. And uh, b before we move on, let me just uh, ask, though, because uh, most of the actors that I've uh, interviewed uh, are members of uh, uh, SAG and AFTRA. Now they're combined. Um, I was, uh, of course, you're probably a, a longtime member. Uh, can you just speak a little bit, though, uh, about uh, uh, the acting union and uh, how it, 
you know, how important it has been or if it has been for your career and, how, you know, for young actors who might be listening. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm a bit out of touch, and I since the merger, and and now particularly with healthcare, yeah. where where they have um, where retirees are no longer covered, uh -huh. uh, uh, it's kind of a shock. Uh, I think unions generally uh, throughout uh, the states have lost their power, and uh, I think the merger has contributed to that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, however, in my, my experience was that they were terrific. Mm -hmm. You know, they were extremely uh, helpful. And, uh, you know, when I went on location or anything like that, I was always, uh, or flights or, you know, I always felt uh, extremely uh, uh, taken care of. Right now, I'm I'm not sure what's what's happening. I mean, I I see there's so many uh, uh, non-union jobs and things like that, and jobs are so scarce that uh, people are taking in everything. And I, I'm I'm really not sure of all the policies that they uh, have in place at this point. Yeah, I know some of the actors I've spoken to said that you know you can get an exemption if, let's say, you're doing a student film or you're doing a particularly low budget film, um, but. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just ask you, though, because uh, uh, I'm seeing here in the early 80s, you did a lot of the TV movies. And back then, I guess, actresses like Valerie Bertinelli and Jacqueline Smith were sort of considered the queens of the, the television movies. And uh, I think you even did a TV miniseries I saw there once. Um, what, what do you think has contributed to the demise of that? I mean, they used to be what they would jokingly call sort of the disease of the week kind of movie. And then we had everything from rich man, poor man, to Roots, to, uh, you know, anything Richard Chamberlain was in. Uh, and then by 1990, it sort of evaporated. Um, oh, what, what are your thoughts on the demise of television movies and uh, miniseries? Yeah, uh, you know, cable has kind of changed everything. Now you've got all these uh, cable shows. It's funny you mentioned Richard Chamberlain. He also did Hamlet um, over in England and got all these accolades. Uh, for doing that, uh, for doing that questionable performance. But in, in any event, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the honest answer is I, I, I don't know why it diminished. I don't know the, uh, the, uh, the whims and vagaries of, uh, you know, of the industry. And uh, I'm sure there are all economic reasons. Of, of, of why why that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do recognize is now you have all these uh, series on cable mm -hmm. uh, that you know certainly uh, uh, you know outshine anything that's on uh, uh, regular television. Uh, one of the first actors that I interviewed was a woman named Karen Austin who was on Night Court, and I see that you made a. a, a did an episode of Night Court, which was actually a, a series created by Reinhold Wiege, who was on Barney Miller. Um, what What are your memories of uh, that episode, if you, if any? Yeah, I have some memories of yeah. that episode. Yeah. Uh, I liked Reinhold uh, uh, very much. He is he around, or is he is he passed on? I think I think he died about fifteen years ago. Yeah, he was quite overweight then. He was yeah. young but overweight, very bright, and. Uh -huh. um, uh, he was on uh, Barney Miller, and then when I left Barney Miller, they wrote this episode, I, I, I guess, for me uh, to do this guest shot. And uh, uh, what I remember is that the lead girl, that episode, was fired. And so it was extended to two episodes. And... Uh, uh, and it was a it was a fun experience. I remember John Alec Larroquette yeah. was on uh, was on it. Yeah. Uh, and I, what what I do remember, which is that everybody was over six four. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. They, I think Larroquette was six four. There was someone that was six eight that yeah. was also on the Mole, show. Richard Mole. Richard Mole. Yeah, he was six eight. And everyone else, and the judge was six four, yeah. and I couldn't believe the uh, how 
how subjective it is to watch television and not have any clue how tall, how much anybody weighs. <laughs> These guys, I walked on the set, I'm not short. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, 5'10", and everyone was enormous. Hmm. And it was funny because the Olympics were at the time in yeah. Los Angeles. And the, uh, the, you would see on TV them running in the marathon, mm -hmm. and they were running by my house in Venice. And I went down, and on TV, everybody looked sort of normal size. Yeah. And, and as they were running by, they were like 5'2", five 5'1". Five you know, they were really, really short. But on TV, they looked normal size. In the same sense, night court, everybody looked normal size, mm -hmm. but they were, like, enormous. Yeah. So that, so you're asking me what I remember about that is uh, I remember the size. Uh, I know uh, I, we talked briefly about uh, Barney Miller, and that was a very uh, smartly well-written uh, comedy show. We had a lot of dry humor with people like Steve Landisberg and Hal Linden. Uh, Night Court, though, was more well-known as a sort of balls to the wall uh, they do anything for a laugh, you know, the most outrageous situations. Um, uh, was your episode, was it particularly just outrageous over the top? or Not really. I, I, I think it was pretty realistic. I think I also remember I, 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 I played a character that thought that certain lyrics, when played backwards, it, it indicated some kind of um, a message, satanic message. Uh -huh. uh, the, the thing about, about Marty, Barney Miller that impressed me uh, was that n no one ever talked about the jokes. Uh, I, I don't think they did a night court either. They were they were too smart for that. The, what they, what and what I mean by that is they emphasized the situation mm. of what was written about and doing it truthfully. And they trusted that within the writing that the jokes would emerge. Yeah. And I, I, and I think that's a, that's a um, uh, a noteworthy thing, and uh, 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 and, and it existed it existed there. Paul, uh, to continue on uh, chronologically uh, with your episodic television, um, I want to ask about three episodes or three shows in a row, rather, uh, that uh, I just have to ask you about. The first one, you did an episode of T.J. Hooker, and I have to ask you, obviously, what was it uh, like working with the the famed Shats, William Shatner? I mean, is he as outrageous as a lot of people claim? No, he was great. I, I, as I remember, he was terrific. He was, uh, uh, he directed the episode. Ah. And his wife was in it at the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, at that time, I, I, what I remember, oh, I probably remember a, a lot. I ever, um, if I was called upon. But what comes to mind first is that the first take, I was in a car. And I had a, it was going moderately, I wouldn't say fast, but moving. Uh -huh. And I had to roll out on the pavement. And at that time, I didn't realize, because it was early on, that you could have a stuntman to do that. Hmm. And somehow I did it. I, and it was assumed that I would do it unless I asked for a stuntman. I think, yeah. or maybe a stuntman didn't exist for that time. And I remember rolling out and it was like, for lack of a better word, it, it was dangerous, <laughs> and 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 I did a couple of takes like that, and it was, and and, and at that time there were a lot of uh, uh, things that were asked for an actor that right now would seem like outrageous. Hmm. That's that's what I remember that uh, about that. And uh, since Shatner, you know, is basically known as an actor, uh, have you ever noticed? Uh, do actors, when they direct episodes, is there anything noticeably different than, than say, someone who's a career director? Appreciative. I remember him as being appreciative, uh -huh. of being um, uh, very uh, supportive and um, uh, complimentary. Uh, and then the next show, uh, you did a Cagney and Lacey. Uh, Tyne Daly and Sharon Gless. Uh, that was, uh, I think, one of the better written uh, cop shows. I'm not a big cop show fan myself, but that was one of the better written cop shows of that era. Uh, what what memories do you have of working with either of those two ladies? I think I did three episodes of, oh, with three? them. I did, I did a uh, couple of TV movies with them when they reunited. Ah. And um, 
what I re what I remember is that they were you know really uh, they, they were sweet girls. Yeah. What can I say? They were they were really nice. Yeah. What can I tell you? Uh, it was it was fun to do uh, and. Uh, yeah, and, and, and had, I, I, it was it was it was you know just a, a pleasure working with them. And I see you did an episode of Hunter, and I interviewed Stephanie Kramer. Did you get a chance to work with her on that show? Yeah, I did. I think I think she punched me in the face in that episode, <laughs> but I have no resentment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it looks like you had a recurring character. Then uh, a few years later on Dallas was uh, how, how long of an arc was that that you did? I think I did a half a, half a dozen episodes of that. Um, I played some detective. I think I was eventually murdered. Ah. Uh, I wonder how many times I've died. Um, and I see uh, you did a show where you, now you said you played Abby Hoffman in the theater, was it, was it not? But it, I did. And I it, it says here, I'm looking 1989. Saturday Night with Connie Chung. Uh, did you reprise your role of that? Because it says Abby Hoffman was the character you played. Uh, I thought Connie Chung was a newswoman. What the? She did a she did a docudrama. Ah. Uh, it's a um, you know a mixture of what happened and played by actors. And um, uh, I think James Earl Jones did the first episode, and. and um, you know, I actually forget who he played. And then I was hired to do the second episode of Abby Hoffman. And the thing was, it was a uh, collaborative thing between the news department and, and her. Uh -huh. And so it had to be, um, uh, I played Abby and it had to be at the exact locations that where Abby was. So uh, when he, he hit out in Mexico, we went to Mexico, I met his family up in, um, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was the news show, they want, they had a, uh, uh, a yen for precision. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun, but they, they had some lawsuits and they were afraid to air it. So I don't think it ever aired. Yeah. Um, I, there were three shows I just wanna, that you did in the early nineties uh, around the same time you did, uh, uh, Matlock and Murder, She Wrote, which skewed towards older audiences. And then also it looks like you did a few episodes of Beverly Hills 90210. And back then in the early 90s, that was like uh, the it show for like advertisers and whatnot. Was there any difference on set when you're doing a show that like 90210 is pop culturally what they would call relevant to, to young people versus these shows that have these older stars like uh, Andy Griffith and... Uh, uh, what's her name uh, from Murder She Wrote? Uh, Angela Lansbury. Yeah, you know, I, you know, the only the only difference in now at this moment, which of course is subjective. So, so I don't know how much it meshes with uh, uh, with the, the reality of what was going on, but it seemed like the longer a show ran, the more tired. In, in general, I'm, and I, I'm really generalizing, that they were in terms of doing it, that there was less excitement. Uh -huh. I'm talking about everybody involved in the show uh, uh, was just, you know, it, it wasn't exciting. If a show was on, you know, the first season or the second season, there was generally a, a, a feeling of, um, yeah, this is great. We're doing this, and it's happening, and we're succeeding. But you know, after six or seven years, they get they're tired, and you kind of felt like uh, you know you were going into the office, and uh, you had to supply your own enthusiasm. Uh, and I see uh, you did the the practice. I think that was uh, the practice was written by oh, who's the fellow? Uh, oh, the, he did picket fences. Um, married to what's her name uh oh uh, names but the i know the practice was uh, uh, uh we identify with you at this moment you know that man yeah yeah 
Uh, and then I see you did the X Files, and I remember that episode. Didn't you? You played a really over the top character who like was, was that the one where he, the guy thought he was uh, the second coming or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. David Duchovny. Um, uh, it's funny because David David called me on the phone. You know, generally you go through uh, agents. Yeah. And he got my number. Uh, through a guy uh, who I knew, an actor, Jim Morrison, yeah. and um, who I did a, 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 a short with, who he, he directed, and he got his number, and David called me on the phone, and I was a fan of The X-Files, so when, when his name came, uh, you know, he, he identified himself, and, um, and uh, so I was quite excited, and he asked me if I would do this uh, episode. Uh, and uh, uh, he had seen the film, and uh, of course I said great, and uh, we did it, uh, and it was great because David directed that. Uh -huh. um, and then I see you uh, did an NYPD Blue. You did uh, uh, a couple of other uh, episodic shows. Uh, I see you did a, a short cat dragged in. Was that one of those things where it was like a student production back in 08? Uh, what was the name of it? Uh, cat, cat Dragged In? Cat Dragged In. Oh, uh, that was that was a um, a, a film that um, uh, Tracy Walter, who was an actor, yeah, you a terrific character actor, his daughter was at AFI and did this film, and Danny DeVito produced it. You know, it's funny, you go to the AFI and you think you're going to school, and uh, and that's the end of your expenses, but then you've got to produce a, uh, a $10,000 short or whatever, or 15,000, which isn't a lot of money, but for students it is. And I think Danny DeVito was in it, and he also, uh, I think, was uh, took care of the finances, and, uh, and I played the, uh, lead character in that. And then it looks like for the last decade, for the first half of the, the teens, you did some more episodic television shows. Um, but it looks like IMDb, the credits run out of 2015. The last five years, have you not done a lot of television? Is that a, by choice? Or, or? Well, yeah, no, I, I would say it's a mixture. I had a son uh -huh. who was a, uh, 21 now, but uh, I spent a lot of time with him my, and, and also writing, uh -huh. uh, consumed a lot of my time. And uh, uh, so uh, what, what, is, it a, is it a choice? No, if someone fucking call and say, hey, we want you to do this film or do this, I'd say, great, that's terrific. As far as actively uh, and aggressively pursuing it, no, I didn't, I was, I was, uh, uh, trying to be the best father I could, mm -hmm. um, and and hopefully I did a decent job at that. Paul, uh, let me just ask you a few questions before we uh, I give you a, a final say so on uh, the craft and uh, anything else you want to say. Um, is there any actor or director that that uh, you would love to work with that you haven't worked with? <laughs> there are many. That I haven't worked with, that I'd love to work with. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, there, there, sure, there are many, many film directors that I admire and, and love to work with, and uh, I mean, it's a whole litany of them, uh, from Woody Allen to uh, name a few. Yeah, Scorsese. Oh, well, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Cop Coppola, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, m many, many that I, yeah, that I'd, uh, I'd love to work with. Uh, no, no question about it. How about uh, any roles? Uh, I mean, if it's like if we're talking theater, is would you? Is there any Shakespearean role or anything by Arthur Miller or some a particular role that if you could could have played that role, you know? Uh, there, there are, uh, you know, there uh, there are many roles that. Uh, uh, I'm enticed by, uh, uh, you know, off the top of my head, 
no. As soon as I, I start reading some, I go great, you know, because I do I do teach uh, at uh, a school called AMDA. Hmm. So I have students that are constantly uh, working on things, and uh, uh, you know they, you know, as I said before, you know, acting is kind of um, uh, in and of itself is an exhilarating, wonderful thing to do. To accept a situation that isn't real and to respond to it in a real way is is a, a remarkable experience and particularly if it's well written you you want to be a part of it mm -hmm. uh i mean i could just you know there, there are just you know hundreds of roles that yeah. that uh i haven't played that would be a challenge and enticing and, and worthwhile and a story to be told so other people can identify with it mm -hmm. uh there's just there's just many of them um as far as something that it, it sticks in my mind right now. In particular, no, there isn't something. I'm not walking around saying, "God, I just want to play Lear," yeah. you know, or uh, you know, "Give me Macbeth." Yeah. Or no, I'm I, I, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the teaching because I had forgotten you mentioned that earlier. Let me just ask you a question: As an acting teacher, uh, I'm sure that there are probably are different young actors that, or even you know, people in older age that turn to acting that have different ideas of how to uh, encapsulate uh, what or embody whatever the character they're seeking to play will do. Uh, as a teacher, do you uh, do you adjust the way that you deal with the different actors in order to help them bring out whatever the best is? Or, you know, are you a top-down uh, teacher or do you sort of let it grow organically from each actor? I think a combination of that. I think there's a certain things that I believe in. I think maybe I, I, I'm not sure if I uh, covered some of those things of, of the understanding circumstances, accepting it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I kind of believe like uh, what uh, Marlon Brando his approach, or, or he once talked about in an interview with with Connie Chung, who we brought up. Yeah. She interviewed him, and he said, "Everybody's an actor." everybody's an actor. He said when a guy goes into his boss and his boss has a shitty idea, the worst idea imaginable, and says, what do you think of this? And he explains the idea and the, uh, him, the guy working for him thinks it's just horrible, but he says to him, hey, that's great. That's really good. I, I really think that's really smart. That's a great idea. So the guy is acting. And what's, what determines what he says that? The listener. Because mm -hmm. it's his boss. So he wants his boss to get that he thinks it's a great idea. So I think, uh, 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 you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, students, you, you know, I try to understand their talent and where they come from. But in uh, another sense, I want to uh, convey to them what I think are what I've been trained are the dynamics of acting. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask a question about a term that a lot of actors uh, sort of get iffy about, and that's being called a character actor. Uh, you know, a lot of people in America here, we want the, the success and whatnot, and a lot of people want to be stars or famous or whatnot. Um, uh, do you, are you someone who, uh, you're an actor first and you can call you whatever you want, character actor or whatnot. Um, what is your take on those actors that are, are stars versus character actors? I mentioned someone like Peter Falk, who at the time was a big star on television, but he was also a character actor in the sense that if you see any of his roles, he's he's not that he's not the the Robert Redford role. He was also a painter, you know. Oh, he was God. also a really good artist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think I grew up when character actors like Pacino and De Niro, who weren't your typical leading men, were playing leading parts, Dustin Hoffman. So uh, it, it wasn't a term that I uh, addressed to myself. Uh, it was a term I heard, but uh, I, uh, you know, didn't really uh, relate to it. I think I relate to it more when I see a Bogart movie and, and or, or movies at that time and I see some of these guys come in that are part of the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 
part of the industry at that time that that were known for playing bit parts and characters. Uh, I, I relate to it from uh, from that perspective. But as, as far as currently or or uh, or part of uh, uh, how I thought when I grew up in the industry, I, I really didn't think about that term. It's interesting you mentioned someone like Bogart or even like Jimmy Cagney. I think Jimmy Cagney was a 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, and you, you wouldn't have a leading man that short today, uh, uh, you know, in doing a Marvel superhero movie. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, what an actor he was. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so let me just ask you if, uh, any uh, final thoughts you have first on the craft and art of acting, something I may have missed. Is there anything that you'd like to just put out there? Well, no, just, uh, you know, I'm the major person I studied with was Mira Rostova, who had the most influence on me, who was uh, Montgomery Cliff's coach, mm. and, um, um, among other things, and she would be on the set. And, you know, according to her, you know, it wasn't the job of the actor to create the situation. It was to accept the situation, to understand what was written and accept it. Um, and then do it. So, you know, somebody comes over to you and says, my, your cousin just died. You accept that it's real and you go, oh my God, what happened? And the job of the actor is to accept it. You don't have to create it. I think that was a, the major thing. Uh, but she said so many things that were useful. You know, don't be a slave to the words. The words are there to serve you. Um, and, and, you know, uh, just, just so many things that, uh, uh, are useful, but, uh, you know, that's, you know, my, 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 uh, take is really what I, uh, uh, learned from her. Finally, let me just ask you, uh, if you have any words of advice for younger actors, either in the craft itself or acting as a career. No. No? <laughs> Just let him wing it. I have no, I have no advice to that. I don't, you know, the industry has changed so much. And, you know, like, for instance, someone told me that uh, his son, the guy's a really good actor, and his son's acting too. And he went to his agent, and his agent wanted to know what social media following he had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, it's so far from the from the training that you received in New York when I grew up with Stella Adler or Lee Strasberg or Mira Restova or Lee, uh, Sanford Meisner, you know, which were mainly concerned with the craft. You know, this idea of, uh, you know, the industry and uh, the business was it was not their concern and they didn't they didn't deal with that. So, uh, you know. And uh, so I don't know. I don't have the uh, the knowledge to point younger actors in the right direction that will uh, strengthen their contribution to the industry. I can tell them to look, study acting and what it's about, and 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 try to understand the great the great plays and identify with them and do them and and you know, go to regional theaters and do theater. But, you know, that may not be most of the, a lot of people come out to LA and all they want to do is be stars. So they have no, no real interest in that. I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't know what to say, except that you put a, Dan, if you've got a kid and you brought him to your place and you, you told him to ask me and I, then I ask what his interests are and, and, uh, and and we got specific in that sense, then maybe I would be of help. But in general, I, I think I'm of no help. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I know I, I do. There was one or two uh, actors, I think, that uh, did tell me that uh, they had to deal with that, uh, trying to get uh, Instagram or uh, Twitter or Facebook followers and, and some agents were interested in that. It seems, you know, for me, kind of silly. But nonetheless, I want to thank you. It was a terrific interview. PaulLieber.com is your website, people. Uh, it'll be linked below this interview. So I want to thank you for spending uh, about 100 minutes or so speaking with me about the art and craft of acting, Paul. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. It's nice meeting you.